Welcome, welcome very, very much to Conversations. It's a pleasure to welcome to the program a dear, 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 dear friend of mine from the old days and continuing, and that being Dee Dee Halleck, the queen of early public access cable television in this country and with implications around the world to talk about public access and communications. Dee Dee, welcome so very much to Conversations for the umpteenth time. Harold, it's wonderful. You, you, I, you've done so much. It's uh, how, what number is this show? It must be. This old. one's going to be up there around three thousand now. It's getting close to three thousand uh, interviews. We've done over a forty-five year period. Yeah, amazing. Of unscripted uh, conversations with all kinds of people. But one of my favorite has been Dee Dee Halleck, and you've been my cohort in the past. We've worked together when you were a Deep Dish, and we want to hear all about that. But this is a mutual admiration society, and so <laughs> we're in love with each other. But let's share a little bit, just a little bit. You've been involved in media for, from the get-go, it seems to me, multimedia particularly. You're a real founding uh, queen of the of public access and the media development in this modern experience, well, it seems it, to me. It started before video because I did a film called children make movies I remember in yeah. 1961 boy that so is way back that yeah. was down at uh, Lillian Wald recreation rooms and settlement part uh. of the Jewish philanthropy uh -huh. organization right and uh, we made films with kids yeah. and actually Marshall McLuhan owned his own personal copy of that film did he really yeah, yeah. <laughs> He bought it, and it, from the Ford Foundation, uh, well, they had a copy, and uh, it was in Filmmakers Co-op. It was one uh -huh. of the early uh, groups of filmmakers getting together, uh -huh. and uh, they distributed the film. And uh, it was, in 1961, it was the only Boy. example yeah. of young people making media. Yeah, that would have been done 16 millimeter. 16 millimeter, yeah. yeah. Steam back? Well, editing. they scratched on the film. Scratch, It was a scratch you, they film. They used to where you actually yeah. cut it, actually yeah. physically and everything, and put pieces of paper and that kind of thing. Yeah. I think I've shared with you, I used to visit with Marshall McLuhan. That's Every what you spring said. from 68 to 71. And I never could become. Did you visit with him? Well, I met him at uh, the Fordham. He was at Fordham University yeah, with John with Culkin, John Culk and right. Father John. Right, and, right, right. And uh, they, he had several conferences there. They were uh -huh. full of nuns. I remember there were a lot yeah. of nuns who uh -huh. came. He was Catholic, yeah. And, uh, and the, the thing is, John Culkin saw early on the uh -huh. importance of media in education. He did. And he had these conferences about media and the, their use in schools and uh -huh. classrooms and stuff. And yeah. uh, my take on it was a little different because I said rather than just looking at films, even uh, talking about them, uh -huh. people should make their own films. Right. So yeah. that's why uh, McLuhan was interested in that. And there was a conference in Oslo in in 62 oh wow and um, back, and yeah. McLuhan took the film there and it was shown at the conference actually I have a copy of the program Wonderful. and it said children make movies Wonderful. and, and they, were, was, they were giving a, a, a critique or a, a, well a important... I didn't go I, unfortunately I I had just given birth to my first son yeah, Ezra uh, yeah. and um, I didn't get to go to Oslo but it was shown and uh, and there was a, some discussion about it. I would have, uh, maybe there's some archive of what yeah. they discussed might be. I'd but like to hear that. It'd be good <laughs> to dig it up, wouldn't yeah, it? Because it's it really into be. that beginnings of a whole new media yeah. genre that was coming. And I was never able, I used to go there. You know, you might have known uh, Rain Dance or Paul Ryan. Right. Paul Ryan's a giant intellectually. He used to live in that dome, that foam dome. You Would that be that? with Bob Schuler upstate? <laughs> yeah, yeah, Bob upstate, Schuler was great. Yeah. He dropped those uh, those uh, granite things into the oceans of the world as a necklace that are embedded deeply in the oceans of the world in case I we blow up. I never saw that. Well, that was a major project that he, Paul videotaped it and everything. Uh -huh. Paul's an intellectual giant, you know, was into Fuller McLuhan and was his assistant when he was at Fordham. He got me into Gregory Bateson. Bateson, Bateson's I a giant. Gregory, and, Absolutely. And Steps to an ecology of mind. I never heard of him. Yeah. 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 And uh, 
I must say it was a, a, a useful book at the time for to think about the ecology of the mind. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was good. I never could get what the Jewish say Hamish with Mr. McLuhan, but he would about. I'd go there with uh, with with Paul sometime, and it was a center for culture. He was a major figure in understanding the ecology of media. He was a really yeah. interestingly wired man. He was an important figure in the 20th century, yeah. Actually, you know, he, he really was a, um, he came from literature, yeah, actually. Yeah, Harold Innes. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. And um, there's an interesting critique of him by, uh, by a, in a book called Twilight something, but it's by Fekety. John, uh, uh, okay, uh, John Fekety, okay, actually, yeah, uh, uh, you might want to look that sure, up, because yeah. one of the things he talks about <coughs> was how McLuhan became the darling of the corporations, and uh -huh. the, the, ad, the what's that program, yeah. like Mad Men? Yeah, right, like Mad Men. That yeah. whole, yeah. they loved McLuhan, yeah, right. and they, he became like the superstar, yeah. so he was on in Life magazine, oh, he yeah. was on a lot of television shows. Because there, they, there was a kind of non-judgmental. He wasn't a critical thinker about mm. the media. He mm. didn't. He he was he maybe was a, super optimistic. Optimistic and also willing to do what he called probes. He would give ideas, and yeah. then people would pick it up, and he had aphorisms and things. He would just be experimenting with an idea, and he was very creative that way in terms of understanding the implications. And he wrote that book, The Gutenberg Galaxy, is a major tour de force well, in terms of the, the various media of communication. Yeah, was the way he used he used illustrations because yeah. all of his books, well, most of them have not understanding media, I think, but the ones after that. Yeah, I think Gutenberg Galaxy. Well, I think Gutenberg's Galaxy was before. It, but he used media, all these yeah. amazing. Uh, icons and imagery yeah. that actually, the, before that, there hadn't been the kind of theoreticians that would actually use right. pictures in there to promote, to, to actually explain their ideas. So I thought that was yeah. very interesting. And he, he was absolutely in love, head over heels in love with James Joyce and the, the Thunders and the Wake and uh, that he really loved Joyce and William Blake, the poets. I mean, he was a real intellectual, and he was really interesting. Yeah, he really, people don't understand that he really came out of literature. Oh, yeah, and, right, and, right, yeah. And that, well, I think, is what Fekete addresses in this, in this essay, which I thought was brilliant. Um, but he was very, um, he, he, what, he, he accepted the sort of corporate view of things in a way that's why when I came across uh, Horkheimer and Adorno's book uh, no, on no. the culture uh, industry, uh -huh. the Frankfurt School, mm -hmm. where there was more of a critical view of it, and then I, I, I started reading Herbert Schiller. Okay. And yeah, that yeah. really opened, like, wait, there is, there's some, maybe all this corporate media isn't all that good. Uh -huh. And maybe we're, it's as, as, Horkheimer and Adorno put it, they, it's the consciousness industry, yeah. and they've kind of colonized our consciousness. Right, right. You know? It is true, yeah. I mean, it would be good to understand it, electronic. And then you became associated with Mr. And then uh, you went I, to we, San Diego. I thought, well, people should, I felt Herb had a way of discussing complicated things. He had this wonderful Brooklyn accent. Right. And, he right. Would, I, and I thought, now, he would be, we should make a program where he can show his ideas and talk about uh, the media. And so that's why we first did uh, Paper Tiger Television. The, the, it, originally, it was just going to be the Herb Schiller show. It really? Is that yeah, right? You did that? Yeah. Well, I know. But then it seemed like a good format. So. But in, in keeping with the fact that this series Conversations airs each weekday, yeah. this is on Thursday, the whatever the date is, the 20th, is it, I guess, or whatever. Uh, yesterday, from the day that people will be viewing this program, we have aired a program with Herbert Schiller that I did. I had read a right. program with him uh, way back when. He was a gorgeous gentleman and everything. And you had the pleasure and the honor of serving with him in San Diego because you were involved at the University of California, San Diego, you too, in terms of media, right? For 17 For years, seven, that's I a ended long up time, teaching yeah. there. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Yeah. I, I, it, 
uh, you and I have both have our uh, problems with the bureaucracies of universities. Oh boy, I'll put it mildly. Yeah, right, right, right. But you held on for. But I held years. on, even though I think there were people in my department who wanted to get rid of me. I'm sure that. there would be if you were saying anything worthwhile. But Herb was very smart, and yeah. I, my appointment was with tenure, so they uh -huh. couldn't fire me from you the beginning. You were appointed from the get-go with tenure. You didn't yeah. have to earn it. That's yeah. good. My daughter's at the university now. She's just about to be considered for tenure. Uh, Fuller used to. Fuller was another giant of the time, and those two met in Bahama. I got a beautiful picture of them together in Bahama. They were two iconic figures of that period, around 1970, when there was so much going on intellectually in the planet. Those two were leaders Who, of that. Uh, uh, McClu Buckminster Fuller, Fuller and Marshall and McLuhan. McLuhan. Yeah. They had told their hard Shardeen. That yeah. was uh, Fuller. I mean, uh, McLuhan last time. That was a very feisty time and everything like that. And that's also about the time that an institution, public access, got started because the cable industry was finally building out the capability for multimedia, uh, multi channel capacity. And you'd be latched onto that right from the beginning too, or the implications of it. You're one of the early founding queens of public uh, of cable access, cable television programming. Well, it actually grew out of my work. I I initially started working around issues around public television. Oh, you did. And uh -huh. we uh -huh. uh, tried to get independence on public television. Uh -huh. I was president of. AIVF, the Association for Independent Video and Filmmakers. Is it still going or not? Or no, it's unfortunately, not. It's all they, they, huh? they closed down. But yeah. actually, uh -huh. there's this group, NAMAC, National Association of Media, Arts, and Culture, which I just went to their conference this last week. That's weekend. right. I got to see And that was there. really good. Uh -huh. and, uh, and But I'm glad that there's some group that is kind of keeping up the... The, the theoretical and policy discussions so that people can get a, a, a picture of the field as a whole. And, right. and what's interesting about NAMAC is uh -huh. they include the arts. So uh -huh. one of the things that they had at the conference was a tour of public art, okay. you know, murals yeah, and sure. public sculpture uh -huh. in Minneapolis, which is amazing. You mean that exists in Minneapolis? Yeah, oh, really? it's very... Minneapolis is a happening town? Well, you or know, no? there are a lot of corporate headquarters in Minneapolis. Are there and, really? I didn't realize And yeah. so... My daughter's there. Well, they that, have, that they have more money... That thing's a big focus money, for me. They have more yeah. money in the, for the arts uh -huh. than any other city. Is that a true fact? It's She's really in the true. arts doing yeah. theater. She teaches the university no, the theater, kidding. yeah. Well, next yeah. time you should go on a tour of the public arts. I would. <laughs> next time I'd get out there, I haven't got had a chance to get out there. I, I think it gets real cold out there in Minneapolis, yes. but she said it's great and everything. But access, then we want to talk some about it. We're right. going to talk about it here as it exists in the modern, uh, you know, in the contemporary situation. But I, I sort of peg it as really getting going in, in big terms, roundabout coming up into the year 1970 or so. When the, when the building of it, I think it was about 10% at that time of the nation was cabled. They were just building out, contracts were being let. Uh, the terms by which public access was to be dealt with by the media companies, particularly cable companies, was being sort of ironed out in, in, in template terms, in terms of the way they were going to relate to one another. It seems to me around that time. Yeah, and actually George Stoney had God done some, our dear uh, forefather <laughs> uh, had done some work in, Canada you using, had a using video. I have a picture right here, yeah, but I don't think it, we can get that well, on. Well, yeah, you could try. You, you could try. try. Here, let me hold that. You just talk. <laughs> Keep talking. I'll uh, try to this. The, and if you can George bring it in Stoney, on the remote camera, if you can bring it in on this, honey. Go ahead. Go ahead. Keep talking. Anyway, he um, he was uh, he did these experiments through the National uh, Film Board of Canada. Yeah, he worked up where there a lot. they they were using public access. They were using video yeah. to use it as a tool for communication between diff between the the different uh, city government okay, okay, and different okay. groups and yeah, okay, and, yeah. and and he f was he felt that it how important it could be <coughs> that here he had come from 16 millimeter and 35 millimeter film. Was. And, but now there was a medium that everyone could tell their own story. Well, and it was getting toward that. Uh, I, w I would submit in a certain sense, in a global sense, we're getting to that now. 
with the internet that's being, true you know now it's really getting universal but at that time it was moving beyond uh, a certain parameter that well he felt that there should be institutions set up uh -huh. using video to enable people to make their own sell their own stories and that's how he and Red Burns set Red up Burns, the Alternate, Alternate Media, Media Center. Center. Right, right. And what they did was they had a program of sending young people as artists in residence uh -huh. to work with the city mm -hmm. to help them uh, understand what the franchise potential was uh -huh. and what the potential of having public access in their own and city. And try like Johnny Appleseed to exactly. spread them across the country to get... And, it, and and so many of those people are still there. Yeah, like right. Sue Busky was one Sue of Sue Busky's students. good. She does yes, really her yeah. work in terms of consulting with them to try and, and do Alan Bouchon. I don't know. Okay, yeah. Uh -huh. They were all like students at the yeah. alternate media yeah, center. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. many of the people who to this day yeah. are leaders in public access. Yeah. Unfortunately, George just passed recently. Okay. We were at, at the a, age of ninety six. At the age of ninety six, and we and mention it seems to be this is public access week because. Because the day before we showed Hubert Schilly, we showed George Stoney, which a piece that included him giving his last hurrah or his last talk to that picnic that you and I yes. were at out there just a couple of day, a few days before he passed. Yeah, a giant of a man in terms of public access. And George was on the board of Manhattan Absolutely. Neighborhood Network for many, many years. I don't think there would have been an MNN, very likely MNN, anything like its dimension as it is now if it hadn't been for George Stone. And Paper Tiger. And Paper and Tiger, fair, indeed. Fair. indeed. Jeff fair. Cohen. That's Jeff Cohen, And yeah. the uh -huh. fairness and accuracy in, in media. Reporting. In, rec in reporting, yeah, right. Yeah. Um, because um, we, there at that time, up until the time that we did the activism, there was only the channel that you could you could submit to Time Warner. Yeah. And we had to pay Jim Schladek to use the studio. Well, he had Metro Media, yeah. And he had that right there next to the on Twenty Third Street. Yeah, Jim yep. Schladek. Yeah. yeah. He's been there forever. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, and Paper Tiger started there in '81 and worked there for many years until we got these wonderful studios here. Well, I can remember, I was just re reminiscing with one of our dear members of the MNN family here, that being Florence Rice. Oh, right. Florence Rice must be in her 90s, and she's an advocate, and she was there. And I can remember way back uh, that in, 19, in the 1970s, I can remember doing a program with a young man at the time called Gerald Levin, who was the head then of home box office, destined to become the whole chairman of Time Warner. Uh -huh. And then also talking to him about how pleased he was that they used to have to, they were building it out, their system. And in order to get that national system with films, which is a big cash cow and everything for the industry, they used to have to send two inch high beam, like canisters of 35, they were huge, <laughs> the tapes. And also, it had to wait for videotape to be invented. Right. Peter Goldmark invented videotape. Yeah. The early st the early storage of uh, archiving of programming was in kinescope, which was film. Right. He discovered videotape. So these discoveries come along and make possibilities for 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 the for the for the for the new. But he was happy as a lark. That is, Mr. Uh, Levin was happy because they could put it when the satellite came, tel teleprompter. Right. Then there comes another satellite, and this is all around 1970. Yeah. That the satellite is there. You put instead of having to send that to each of the head ends, huge job of distribution. The the big canisters like film, you could put it on the satellite, bring it down to the whole thing, and build a network. He was as happy as I was and when they started YouTube. And that's what Deep Dish did. Yeah, Took you got involved in that, that very early. Because Deep Dish, what yeah. we did was in 1986, we leased the satellite and started sending programs. In what up. year, honey? 86. 86. That's kind of late. Yeah. This when I was with Mr. Levin was earlier. Yeah. That was 74. Yeah. And they had just invented videotape. Yeah. That's a big thing. And yeah. the thing is, there's synergies between the various things that make possible a major transformation. It's a characteristic of evolution, even if you begin to understand the way evolution works. But again, coming but back... But I just hope things don't always evolve into becoming more and more bureaucratic and more and more... Um, 
repressive. And what I'm upset right now is mm -hmm. about M and N. And maybe we could roll tape. Well, if you want to, yeah, if um, you are. I, I I tried to go to the uh, opening. I think it's wonderful. That and I love the building. I must say the firehouse that that was. Yeah, done they got a whole new thing M &M going up in Hundred uh, Fourth Street. Yeah. The architects and they were at this. They came into this uh, opening. Uh huh. Uh, and we met them at the door, mm -hmm. but um, they did a superb job of like saving elements of the architecture. For example. Yeah. Although they didn't use the old wainscoting, yeah, they actually right. bought wainscoting and put it in there. So it has yeah. this feeling of what the old um, firehouse, the firehouse yeah, used uh -huh. to be, you uh -huh. know. And um, and so we were very excited. I went with uh, someone who lives up there in East Harlem and who's like almost like the kind of mayor of East Harlem. Yeah. I, you didn't. It wasn't daylight and yes last night we were there and yeah if you walk down the street with Papoletto yeah. Melinda it's like walking with the mayor or something. Like, everybody oh, comes up and shakes like, his hand and he's a very well-known character right right so Papo and I tried to go to the opening of the firehouse and if that we could roll back tape, in June of this year no did? no just now I mean it was uh yeah they it, did have one in June of this year that was like a a Harlem day or yeah, something. Yeah, I didn't get a chance this, to get to that. And yeah. I went there. But um, this was more recently. Mm -hmm. I think it must have been July. Mm -hmm. um, but okay. you, if we could roll the tape. Well, we okay, but that. what we're talking about is that we're here in 59th Street, the main thing for right. the Manhattan Network, and it's growing, and they're fortunate they just had their franchise renewed, and it's a very good contract, apparently, and there's going to be a lot of major changes, and there's a lot of uh, questions of what that means in terms of public access, how things are going to be organized in a way where we've been sort of running on empty in a certain way for three years without the franchise having been renewed in a timely way like it normally had been. And those franchise agreements have been worked out since about 1970 with the cable industry, and now they've gotten that. So there's some questions about what it, what it, what it, uh, you know, uh, we roll the tape? Uh, yes. offers. And so we've got a tape, and it's around. We're gonna. About, it's a longer tape. We're gonna run about 10 minutes of it. It's called. You've got it called one. The one percent visit the barrio. So this is with Dee Dee Halleck's film that you put together about that. So let's run it, please. Yeah. Thank you, Gloria. For a bridge in the freedom of the press. sound in here, please. For the right of the people, peacefully to assemble, free people. Hi, I'm Jesus Papoletto Melendez. Everybody knows me. I'm uh, one of the original founders of the New Rican Poets Movement. And I was born and raised here in East Harlem. We're on 104th Street between Lexington and 3rd in front of the m and Studios where the firehouse used to be here when I was a kid. I'm being banned from coming in today. Uh, although there is a community meeting here that's open to the public, politicians are gonna be here, all kinds of people from outside our community. But I live in this community and I'm not being allowed here. I know how to use video equipment. I know how to use Final Cut Pro, <laughs> but yet, I'm being locked out of here. So I'm going to release my article called Digital Apartheid in El Barrio because I feel that this is just what's going to happen. If you don't cooperate with these people, you can't use the facility in your community. So that means that they're tyrants in our community or in control of public access, which means the public has no access. Mm -hmm. Hi, good morning. How are you? Good morning. How are you? Okay. So you're letting the press in? Can we come in for democracy now? I always thought she was cool, but I know that she wasn't. You know? Here's Jose Angel. Here comes the poet. Community <laughs> representative. Hello. Good morning. Would you like to say something about public access? Don't fuck with me. Hey, fuck you. No, no, no. No, no, no. That's exactly what I said. I said fuck you. me? No, no. Go inside. I just said fuck you. No, it's okay. You're going to get in with that attitude? I don't have an attitude. You're the one that had the attitude. He was the one who had the attitude, boy. Okay, it's our film, the Josie baby. Free speech, yeah, yeah. or a bridge in the freedom of press. Free press, for the right of the people, peacefully to assemble. Free people, petition. 
And he took he took out after you. He, he, well, he almost hit me. Yes. <laughs> Wish he had. <laughs> okay. Hey, good morning. How are you? Hi. As long as you don't live in the community, you're welcome to go in there. I am. Yeah. If you live in the community, you can't go in. Hell no. Why? Because this is not for the community. I thought it was built for the community. No, it's not built for the community. It's built for whomever they control in the community. Oh, we're being denied access, and I live in this community. I live like six wow. blocks away from here. Wow. But I'm not being allowed in, and I almost got attacked by this guy just now. We have it on tape to show to you. So the Hi. meeting here is going to be bogus. Hello. This is bogus you welcome. Want to me as an actor? <laughs> you know? Are you an actor? Yes. What? I want to be. Are, yeah. well, who, are, are you here? here today? Why am I here? I got invited. <laughs> Uh-huh. Who do you represent? I represent the contractor that built it. Oh, well, right. you did a great job, Thank I must say. Much. It's a beautiful, beautiful yeah, building. Really nice. it yeah, it's, it's really... To it, but we're not being allowed in. I can't do anything about that, buddy. No, that's Sorry. okay. That's okay. <laughs> that's what the 99ers are for. Hi, Peter. How are you? Good. You know, we would like to come in, and I understood this is the official opening, and we'd like to... I live in the community! Good morning, good morning. Good morning, good morning. You will get in once. I told you, you will get in. Yeah, but you know, eh? <laughs> Hi. De dónde viene usted? Okay. So, I mean, th this is just you know what everything that we fought for fails here. These are tyrants in control of a community facility where they're not going to let the community participate. They're not just blocking me. They're blocking me in preparation of blocking you. You know how are you going to take someone? as renowned as myself, who has done video and many community supportive activities, and you're gonna keep me out of this place. I remember when this was a firehouse and when that was a police station. So are these conga players coming? Yeah, they're the musicians that are gonna play. <laughs> Don't die, bro! Come back, come back, come back. Come back. Okay, we're back on the set. Oh, bring down the mics a little bit. So that was a piece of tape about Pablito, the beautiful guy and everything. It seems to be a conflict between, you know, some people running the system and that. And it's something we ought to address. I'd like to build some bridges if we can and figure out what's going on. But that's, uh, they're, they're opening that new system over there, and so I don't quite, that was a, a thing that presents it. Is it any, uh, is there any uh, ability, or can you see anything developing where you can build bridges of confusion between whatever was being represented on that tape and so forth? It was an indictment of the MNN system, and uh, well, how do we address it and how do we deal with it? Because we don't... want to have everybody involved in the best yeah. possible way. Because everybody involved is trying to help. It seems to me, among all the p media people in New York City and so forth, the public access realm is one that more than any other deals with some of the least advantaged people within our society more than any of the corporate media. They've got a common thing for that. And it's too bad if there's fighting going on between the people who are trying to help the masses of the people in a way that I think public access is trying to do and Papalito and his colleagues are trying to do too. We ought to somehow get a bridge built between these people because we have common interests in terms of what we want to achieve, but there's conflicts of personality, conflicts of bureaucratic uh, getting together and that kind of thing. Or where do, where do we stand? What do you think? Well, I, what bothers me is that, it, that the 
the firehouse seems much actually more closed than this space here. Or maybe just getting started or something. Yeah, yeah. but it's mm. like okay. they there would be different ways of of running it, and that it could be more of an open um, facility. You you don't feel welcome there. Um, actually, it was interesting. You asked me about the June opening. There was a kind of open house in June yeah. as part of a kind of barrio-wide uh -huh. uh, series of things. And I was there that day, and I went to different things. I went to one at the Museo del Barrio, which is a wonderful place. I don't That's know over if on, Bro on, Bro on, on Fifth Side. Avenue. Yeah, Fifth, Fifth Avenue. It's in yeah. that museum yeah, right, mile. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, it was the museo who sold the for one dollar. I think the firehouse? the firehouse was because it really? I didn't that, know that was part. Uh -huh. of, I guess the landmarks commission had said they couldn't tear it down, and yeah. or and so it just seemed like an interesting place. But of course, there yeah. a lot of money went in to re because the building was in bad shape. Well, I was shape over there what ten or five or six years ago when they had a street festival right in front of it, it was just a firehouse and yeah. Mr. Wrangell came and all right. that kind of stuff and they they had gotten the place and yeah. they, they've been able to get a new a new facility which is really good. It's and gorgeous. And it's time just it's really when they got nice. this new franchise. So there's a lot of new things coming online and so there's when things happen, it's, it's, it, you usually get some sort of conflict between understanding or misunderstandings between people who have varying levels of responsibility for a new development that's going on. Well, what happened when, when I went to the museo, it was fantastic. It mm -hmm. was, everyone could walk in. There were families there with their kids. There was a wonderful um, poetry slam session with some high school, junior high school yeah, kids. But the museo's been there a long time. It's been there a long time. Yeah, so things get settled in. And then we went yeah. down to 104th Street yeah. to the barrio, and it was like dead. There was, there was one guy there who was actually very interesting uh -huh. because he was uh, the son of a fireman who had lived there. Uh-huh, uh -huh. But I, there, the, everything else, and everything was so kind of cold. There was no... You know, if I was opening like a facility like that, I'd put some of the TV on. I'd show some videos well, that people were playing, and it, it was just, it was prohibitive. It was cold. It was kind of um, sterile. There was no life in it, and well, and there were no people there. And and yeah. you could see that when you, if you look at the door, mm -hmm. instead of people welcoming, there were like three security guards. Mm -hmm. But why? They didn't have three security guards at the museo. But the museo had been in established for decades. It was all well established. Everything gets in. You know, when something's just first opening up, it's hard to start something new. You're starting something new. Maybe things aren't all finished. There's a few things. And you know what I mean? Things, but all the things more are, reason to I don't make understand. it open, to err well, on the part maybe, of Maybe, but on the other know? hand, you got a new thing. You don't want to have people, you know, you're, you're, you're not sure. You don't want to have... Good crowds coming in and stamping over the equipment and just a chaos raining and all that. Because you're a little insecure because you're just getting a thing get uh, stuck. I'm just trying to see. I just think the museo has time. things a lot more. Yeah, but they've been there for a long time. No, but I mean, there's no reason that there could there it there at that point there wasn't even any equipment in the firehouse well so oh, it, there was a few computers upstairs well, you get, but okay. you know what i what i'm trying i to would say, have set the computers on and let people sit there and always, use it when you know? they're doing it so you got a different take on what it is somebody else has a different take you got conflicts between what right. somebody did you ever go to a party that you think it's going to be raucous with bands and then all of a sudden there's ballet dancers or something and <laughs> or the opposite or, or the opposite or <laughs> What, you know, and this is New York too. You got different yeah. personalities of a girl. And what I'm trying to well, get at, in a certain sense, if I may, is that as far as I can tell, everybody. I come back to it again. I'm, I'm a long. I think I'm not sure, but I think I got the longest running P, uh, public access um, series and... <laughs> in the country. I'm not sure they're still running, right? Yeah. Because we got started with Paul. And uh, uh, that uh, the, the, about the seventh or eighth port of pack that came off the boat from Japan. Yeah. When the videotape became, and you had a port, you remember that, and you could make a television. I was off to watch it. Reel to reel, yeah. Reel to reel, load it up, black and white. Thread it through yeah. the little thing and put thing a little piece there. of paper yeah. to keep track yeah. of where everything was. But it was the beginning of individual television. Right. Now everybody, we've gone. That's only. 
that's only about 40 years ago or something, but that was just getting started and everything. And what I'm saying, public access does exist across the country. They do have the alliance. They do have this historic, uh, as an institution. George Stoney was interested in getting that done. I wasn't paying much attention to it. I was just doing programs with people, putting them on. And Florence Rice, like I said, we were up there. They had a, they had a studio on 100, 125. Right. And it was 74. Teleprompter. It was teleprompter, or, or I don't know, it could have been Sterling Manhattan. Or there were yeah, different Sterling companies. Man. There were entrepreneurs developing, yeah. so it's new. Cliff Fraser. You yeah, I remember Cliff Fraser. Fraser, yeah. But they had that, and he we had, had a guy come. Point. It was the impeachment of Mr. Bush, Mr. Uh, Nixon. Uh, Nixon. Guy came, uh, Hershenson, came all the way from the White House in Washington to do a program on 125th, and it was 1974. Wow. So there was this connection with the cable industry, and they agreed to set aside a certain amount of their net of tax earnings, I think 5%, for PEG. Well, it's really the rent for the rights of way to go into the, uh, to the, to the tunnels to run their wires and all that. I mean, it, right. And but also in, for from from taking up space on the city streets. Well, that's and, true. You know. that, that would be the argument that could be put forth and everything like that. But it was also political in the sense because they were going to tap into, like Lord Beaverbrook in England said, that was going to be, you can bring a cable into the home, an institution where you bring data and programming. It was going to be a license to print money. People were going to make a lot of yeah, money. They could yeah. see that. So, But they did agree to that, and they've held with it over the decades since about 1970 to set aside something as a model, something like 5% of their net of tax earnings for PEG, public, educational, and governmental. The governmental, that's Mr. Bloomberg and company, and then institution, that's New York University, Columbia school system, that takes up 4%. 1% is left over of net of tax earnings in the model that was set up and adhered to since about 1970. Again, that's a magic time for public access, where they would right. set up a facility where the, uh, the cost of the operation would be met by these franchise payments so that the producer could produce programming, if they kept to it, right. for no money at all, no cost at all, which is very, very unique in a society where you assume that anything that's going to be done for free has to be either bad or of no consequence, but they set it up. And it's very unique. Nothing else like that exists in terms of... Mr. Paley had no obligation to make an agreement for the citizens to produce programming. The only place where it is, is there. And they also set up an interesting relationship with Brian Lamb and C-SPAN. Those are two very important avenues of communication. And uh, this is part of that system. But, and it's, but, but it's also, you know, the thing about public access is that it, it's, def it's always under threat. We always have to protect it because the cable companies want those channels back well, and they would yes rather, and, no. and the yeah. city also yeah. would rather keep that money and not just give it to, but. No, the, they get there. The city gets their 2%. The I, government they does. would like to get our percent too, Well, I'm maybe sure. they would. There's yeah. always vulture yeah. people yes. in that. There's always people who do but that. In the but meantime, it is held. It is in held. the meantime. No, but it's unique, honey. It's it unique is. in the it history. Is. Mr. Paley had no obligation or the capital markets. It was only in cable where that system, where people could make legitimate, and George Stoney institutionally helped to set it up, where they, that's an institutional connection where you could have the citizens connected to serious technologically advanced capability of making serious programming and get it out and not have to have any thought about money. Now, that's almost thought of as subversive in the mind of the market-minded people and so forth. But that's very unique, and it ought to be safeguarded to the degree that we possibly can. And then make it available not only to the well-to-do, who have lots of money, that favors them, 1% or the, the middle class or something, but to all of the people, make it available to all of the people. And that's a hell of a challenge. And yet all the people in public access tend to be more favored toward the least advantaged people within our society than any of the other networks combined. That's for sure. So you and I and Papito and Manhattan Network and, and Alliance, they are all in the same boat. Yeah. And we should be learning to bridge ourselves and we'll work some, some sort of thing out know. between the differences that do always occur among creative people. Well, you know, the thing is that that you know, it, it is a public institution, yeah. and it cannot be run as if it's a, 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 a fiefdom. And
And that's, I was uh, hired by the state of Ma Massachusetts, uh -huh. the Ma Massachusetts Arts Council, um, to do a, an evaluation of, I think it was seven public access stations. You were, when was that? That was about, I don't know, 11 years ago, something, okay, 12 years ago. Okay, sometime back, yeah. Uh -huh. Sometime back, mm -hmm. and, um, and for, because they were opening up a new line of uh -huh. their grants okay. to actually give some Arts Council money uh -huh. to public access stations, because they felt uh -huh. that actually public access stations, particularly in Massachusetts, they're terrific. Are they really? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. They, that they deserve to be encouraged to include the arts in terms of their training, in terms of the way they're set up. Mm -hmm. So I went around and I visited all these different stations, which included Cambridge, uh, Falmouth, uh, Provincetown, uh, a number of places, uh, Worcester, I think it was, and I was um, I was amazed at how each of these were like they're really community centers for their yeah, that's population. What wanted, yeah. They were mm. open mm -hmm. so that there was an exchange of people who, in other situations in this society, they don't get together. So, for exa example. You know the the group who are doing lesbian rights yeah. would get together with the guys who are doing country music. Yeah. You know, uh -huh. and ordinarily these you mean are at people. At a community center, and uh, well, just the, because their programs were next to each other, they or they would come for a meeting. Yeah. That there was a sense that this was like a center where lots of different groups with different interests. Well, that can happens come together. here. And that happens here. That happens that here. That is not happening. Well, up get, at, maybe up we have at, to give them a the chance. I mean, it, it house, wasn't. Yeah. I can remember when this place first opened. There were a lot of loose ends. It was all you know, just building up and everything. Now it's getting down. This is the most active broadcast development of broadcast quality. No, broadcast television and so forth of any other institution in the United States of America is Manhattan Neighborhood Network. They produce more media than any other entity, including all the networks. I mean, there's a lot going on, and you've got lesbians, you've got uh, hate lesbians, you've got blacks, you've got whites, you've got ladies, you've got men, you've got all kinds of things, and it mixes very well, and they all get together every once but in a while. That, but you've got to give them a little time to get this new thing up and going, because it's also just coming at a time where everything's going exponential in terms of the computer, everything's a computer, and now everything's going HD. So it's a whole other universe that's being born before us, and yeah. they've got a new baby child over there that they want to make sure it's up to date and they want to get everything up to date, change. A lot of buggy whip makers were upset with this new automobile when it came along, that kind of thing. And thing wasn't, act you don't understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So, and no, what we I... ought to do is understand each other and not be fighting among the people because we Absolutely. all have a common interest in supporting a well-organized society that can benefit not only the middle class is one, uh, but not, not not to mention the the wealthy class, but the least advantaged people in Manhattan Network is doing that more than anybody else in this country. In this but whole Harold, world. I'm worried that because of it, I do feel very different coming in here than I do at the firehouse. Well, it's For example, nobody gave me a paper up there. When you walk in, they give you a paper that says you cannot. Be aggressive and hit someone. You're no, not doing this. One. We got a thing like that. But it's, they, it's the okay here. to yeah. You yeah. post it. That's the way proper way to do it is to post it, not to like put it in your face. It makes you feel it's an insult. It's sort of like oh here you're coming in, so we better like make sure you, uh, you know, we. It's not exactly stop and frisk, but there's an assumption of guilt there that's a little troubling. And last night at the board meeting of Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Yeah, we were there, yeah. Yeah. They, the, the, the chair read this out. It was the most insulting thing. As my friend who, who worked in the school system for 25 years, she said she'd never been insulted like that. And she said, like, if you look at the list, like half of the things are, law, are, are crimes. Mm. Like, who, who walks into a place and has somebody read them and say, you cannot commit this crime? Of course you can't commit that crime. Yeah. It's like the police will come. You, you don't have to tell me not to uh, assault anybody. <laughs> like, mm. why, are you, why are you reading this? Mm. It was, like, very insulting. And, and I think 
the people. What's your the, worry? The, but, worry? But to see that, yeah. it's racism. It's like because it's in the ghetto, they feel like, oh, we better like make sure nobody does this stuff. You know, it's like, whoa, hey, this isn't 59th Street. This is 104th Street. Is that so, the ghetto? Yeah, I never even thought Well, it it's the, the barrio. I mean, yeah. that's that's not it's my thinking. Speech. It's, it's free, free speech. speech. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, yeah. And yeah. it should be free speech. And yeah. we should talk about. This uh, your friends who are having so much trouble with the free speech. You know? I, uh, uh, yeah, by all means, Freedom uh, Party. Yeah, giving a plug to Paula, who's uh, Paula Gloria, a delightful uh, friend and uh, producer farther down the rabbit hole than her, her husband uh, is uh, uh, Joe Barton. They're doing such good work in terms of freedom in general and their media and so forth. So we're plugging their Freedom First Party. Net uh, to view uh, police uh, dash cam things. They're yeah, doing great things. Yeah, just tell people to go to freedomfirstparty.net, and we've posted the police dash camera. It's an absolute miracle that the police gave up the dash cam of our bus when they pulled us over for a tail light. Uh huh. And I think they were hoping we would only sue the policeman. But if people go to freedomfirstparty.net, mm -hmm. you're going to see it and write, 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 email, email, email the judge because we've now had judges recuse themselves from our case. Okay. And it's all because of public access. So, Dee Dee, thank you so much. I've learned so much in the control room here and I'm so impressed. Right. With ever your footage. Yeah, okay. Ever, 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 uh, ever conscious and being vigilant against uh, creeping uh, bureaucracy that can become oppressive. There is that Lord Acton said, uh, "Free, uh, what is it? Um, power tends to corrupt. Absolute power corrupts no. absolutely." And something could be on. A, 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 I think people are very much in mind of that. But I also want to keep in mind that we want to have something alter. It's a larger t template. I think there's a great deal of free-floating angst in the world today. I don't know if you feel that way. Uh, not just off your personal situation. I think they may be coming to the end. The the, the powers that be might be coming to an end of where a system that's been held for a long time is not going to hold both uh, uh, governmentally or economically. They don't have as uh, they might have had if academia, well, all the king's horses and all the king's horse, uh, men of all the institutions with the trillions of dollars that have gone into supporting all of the institutions of research and all of the universities and all of the think tanks and all of that have not yet been able to come up with an, what would be comparable to an effective operating manual for spaceship Earth relevant to the emerging future. They do not have an idea of what the, uh, the whole parameters of how we're going to operate. So this question of how we're going to operate, they've not been able to come up with it. They've discouraged systems thinking where intellectuals could come up with that. Fuller and some other artists and McLuhan and so forth tried to do that. They haven't come up to it. So there's a great deal of free-floating anxious worry about the whole uh, economic system is going to implode over the debt thing and all of that. They don't well, and have all a vision. The f we're speaking today when, <coughs> yeah, yeah, uh, two days ago, to the embassies are under siege. The U.S. embassies are well, completely under siege. Well, they are in Benghazi. Siege. I and, used to, yeah. and, and also they in Cairo, in and they yeah. killed the ambassador. Yeah. But in the, that is based on a video that was up on the anger, was based on this video that was up on YouTube. So some friends wrote me saying, well, Dee Dee, what do you think? Did they... Should we censor YouTube? You know, should should YouTube? Who's going to make that kind of decision? Right. Who's going to say this? Once you open up the, the that process yeah. to censorship, is you know, I mean, I think we're there's a lot of thinking we all have to do to figure out ways to, as you said, to make people get together to to build a world where well, where we're not. Uh, <laughs> killing each other and sending drones. I could, that was one the of drones the drones are horrible. Yeah, uh, isn't we're doing, that and it's awful? being done it's in like, our name. All right. Exactly. So there is. We should not just sit there and allow things to be done. And the point. The point being is collectively, we have fallen intellectuals, it, as is expressed through the uh, political process. Uh, that that's part of it. And then the other thing, they don't have a basic premise of what the realities are in terms of capability. We said before, 
We have a capability since about 1970. That was a major marker. They call yeah. it DNA research. That's a marker. There were markers of that time. And it, Woodstock Festival wasn't just sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Let's have a party. There were all kinds of things going on in the evolutionary process of qualitative existential challenge to the evolutionary process led by the homo sapiens species yeah. that we haven't been able to take the measure of. We need more trying sex, to drugs, it. and rock and roll. Well, know? no, you don't need, you do, no, you can have sex, drugs, and rock and roll, but you need more understanding and, and, and an operating manual for spaceship Earth. Yeah, but we how we're going to heart attack either. How we're going to form capital. We have a system that is, is intrinsically in, uh, appropriate for the masses of the population. Income in disparity is growing. The way we form capital, the way we address the resources of the country, the assumption that there is not enough. We may have transcended at the level of capability to scarcity, material scarcity. We've overlooked the major paradigm shift because we're so focused on the outdated institutions that are reified. So we need some vision. And where that's going to come from, maybe, is going to be coming out of public access as an entity. It's going to be coming out of the free-floating, uh, autodidactic, scholarly people, because the institutions, our institutions of learning, have been all corrupted, or not corrupted, um, co-opted by yeah. specialization. They become so specialized out, nobody's thinking about the whole system like the, the people of the past. But so public ought access to, will save us. <laughs> well, public access has an opportunity, but we shouldn't be fighting each other yeah. because we are on the same team. I and remember there's a, a wonderful assert. guy. Paul up in Woodstock, there's, you and yours, Papalito, Manhattan Network, and let's all try to get together and help each other rather than fight among ourselves like they would try to have us do about some crumbs or something. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to get at. Actually, Elliot Margulies, who runs the Access in, in Stanford, in, Stanford, in Palo Alto. Palo, Palo Alto. Alto, wow, yeah. big time stuff. He's a yeah. wonderful guy, an old time public access person, and he made a wonderful promo mm -hmm. for, uh, for Deep Dish that he, he, his son asked him, Dad, why do we have wars? His son was six Absolutely. years old. Why do yeah. we have wars? Right. And he's sitting there with a stack of t videos, and he said, it's because we don't have enough public access. Well, <laughs> that's very. Is there? Is that a P, Is that a thing that's been put on tape or something? Yeah, yeah. Send me the link. Will I you? will. <laughs> we ought to do that because I think it might be true. It'll be coming out of access more than it'll be coming out. Of, the more you're ensconced within the system, and particularly if they try to professionalize it and make everything like the networks, uh, you the the. It's, they just had this series, uh, we had a guy on the board now, God bless him, of Manhattan Network, good to know how things are being done and everything. It's a, it's a what do they call it a, uh, in the Navy when you just do a first ship, I forget what they call it, it's a sea legs trip or something, uh -huh. you're, getting, you're getting your sea legs going. But he's from, uh, 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 remember he's, he's a guy from uh, Home Box Office. HBO. Home Box Office just did that major series called uh, Front Page, Front uh, what they call it, in a newsroom. Right. That's a major critique of the whole society right. and everything like that coming so out of So maybe them. he'll learn something being on the Maybe, but board. they did. But that's the exception because mostly it's done to pay chasing the Nielsen and doing that. They haven't been able to come up with, it's, it's innocuous, the programming that you get about yeah. somebody being dysfunctional, taking drugs or, or something like that. The news, if it leads, it bleeds, and all those kind of rumor basing, there isn't serious. Most serious things are on cable, and some of the most serious investigations of the real questions that are existentially significant will be coming out of public access, very likely. Yeah. This place is going to become very much more important than it has been, in my humble opinion. Yeah, I think so, too. You think so? So don't you think we ought to try and get together and get over these petty Absolutely. differences? Absolutely. I think yeah. we should open the firehouse that's my in in well, a, to time. the neighborhood. See, you know? What do they call that when you go on it? I forget what they call that in the Navy when they just go out on the first cruise or so. They got a term for yeah, it. Yeah, but, but anyway. we've been around, and they should also reinstate the grants because the grants were very important to many well, community mm -hmm. groups around the city. Well, okay, and that is something. Do you think maybe it is what they want to do? If they're professionals, they would like to be able to make all the television programming. What do they call it? Broadcast value or broadcast or quality? Broadcast quality, not broadcast quality. They call it, you know, production values. 
So you want everything to be like gone with the wind. And you can get the kind of things you need when you get to get big visions and professional. And they'd like everything to be professional. And they don't want just people like you and me sitting here talking. They don't want just things like they want production values and professional quality, like the networks where they're making money and that sort of thing. So that's the way people think about make the product really good, put a lot of attention to it, pump a lot yeah. into it. And so they'd rather be dealing with professionals than the people are not professionals. But that's, if, you, if you're but, thinking about the people having a say, the less advantaged people, that's people that are not even middle class, maybe. They're people that are just talking their own thought in their own church or something. You know, it's not, you know yeah, But the what I'm whole saying? premise of what George Stoney uh, fought for and developed was that, that people should have access to the technology themselves and not depend upon professionals who come who who may not see things professionals don't the like same the same way that right. they see it i know but so professionals that, don't like that professionals well, if you're a painter you don't want to have somebody coming in off the street if you're mr van gogh and you're painting a painting he says let's make a bird here or something or somebody comes in and says let's have my grandchild or some sort of idea they don't want them coming in they're artists they want to think that way but that's a big problem and then also all the world is becoming uh, invested because the Everybody can now make high-definition television on their cell phone, for crying right. out loud. I mean, it's coming into where everybody's in the ballgame yeah. now, so there has to be room for everybody. And there are people who, are, who, who think they're professionals, they want to set themselves aside. A professional wants to set themselves aside from the mass. They mm -hmm. don't want to be just like a mass thing, because the way you get something is by being distinctive and different. You remember Judy Garland being in uh, Gone, uh, you know, Wizard of Oz. You don't remember all the... Uh, you know, the, the uh, under five actors yeah, that appear in the background. Content is the key. Okay. Because, you know, one of the most broadcast uh, moments of television what was? Was, that? was the, the, from the, the Mr. Halliday who shot Rodney King. Oh. And now what was the, what was the, the uh, the broadcast quality of that uh, video kind of grainy, wasn't it? But Couldn't it we get better like, high def on that? But, but yeah, that was yeah. that was a, a, a that, iconic, it yeah. was the content yeah. can, and that's, content, yeah. not the, the particularly uh, apropos. We have all the social media way of communicating. One of the we could go on talking for hours. We've just yes. talked for an hour. Didi, so good Thank to talk you, to Carol. you. Let's try yeah. to all get together if we can. Thanks for viewing the Queen of Early and continuing our public access. Uh, Monitoring the public access realm adroitly is uh, Dee Dee Halleck. Thanks a lot for coming. Give my best to Joel when, oh, okay. uh, when you see him. Please tune in. We'll be coming back again tomorrow. Thank you very much. So I don't know. I got off on a rant and everything, but I just think we ought to all get together. We ought to. I, I like that thing. Could you show me that thing where the guy said, "Why do we make war?" Oh, I've got a. Uh, it's, it's one of the best. We ought to use it as a generic. I know. Well, you could give it here. No, don't do it. You might be still mic. They might still be mic on YouTube. Don't don't just leave your mic alone. Just let it go. Yeah. Okay. So the thing is You're that. Uh, well, okay. are we out now? Okay. Yeah, okay. So anyway, we might be able to use that as bumper uh, footage on, uh, on, on the Between the Programs here.